Father, as we open your word today, I pray that your spirit would direct us and guide us. I pray for us as a congregation that you would not only just give us wisdom and knowledge, but also give us wisdom, give us discernment, that we'd hear your voice. Thank you, Father, for your word, and I pray that it would not return void. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we were in this same book, Mark chapter 6, earlier in the in this chapters, starting in verse 1, and we were talking about representing Jesus. Representing Jesus. And that we talked about the first item there was that there will be offenses, there will be unbelief, there will be people who will not want to hear what you're talking about when it comes to knowing God. They just are going to stick their heel in the ground and they're going to say, I'm not listening to you, the wall's going up, forget about it. So don't be surprised. Don't be surprised, Jesus said. Expect it and pray for them and uh, keep going. Keep going. Um, there's also a mention in that same section about people in our lives who will have their eyes on the wrong thing. They'll be looking at a person instead of seeking the Lord. And so there will be offenses. Be ready for it. Also, remember that God has got this. He's in charge and God is God. And we really don't have to worry about that. So in, in that case, develop good fellowship. Good fellowship is a big deal. You agreed? Would you agree? Big, good fellowship is important for us as we grow. And, and we need to remember to keep the work of the ministry simple. Our eyes are not to be focused on building cathedrals. Our eyes to be focused on building people and ministering to one-on-one. -on -one. Remember, Philippians, my God shall supply all your need. Every need that you've got, he'll take care of that. And it's interesting to watch that. And when you pray, um, by the way, don't forget just to listen. Uh, it's so easy, blah, 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 blah. And in Jesus' name, amen, then get up and run. Stop the presses, everybody, and just stop and listen to the Lord and what, what the Lord would be saying. Third, we are responsible to share. Our job is sharing, sharing, sharing. God is the one who's responsible to take care of the outcome. So just get in the habit of sharing your testimony, sharing what Jesus has done in your life. Uh, I think we forget that simple story, but God has given each one of us a unique story. So let that story ring out. So our context uh, today is that Jesus was very popular wherever he went. We see that in a number of places here already in this book. And people are learning that he was a great preacher, uh, but that a lot of people were coming to him for healing. Remember, it's, it was not just the preaching, but there was healing involved, and then there was the casting out of demons. And we see all of those. Jesus said, my purpose is to preach. He's talking about the eternal fashion. But the word is out. Jesus is somebody special. And before Jesus, there was this other guy named John. You remember John at the beginning of this book? John the baptizer, John, some call him John the Baptist. Um, he was calling people to repentance, turn around, run, follow God. And it's, as we read this text, we look at what you're saying to us, Lord. But we come back, we turn around, and we look for God's purpose in our life. So as we read this text today, we're looking at the background, but we're also looking at the application. As I said, it's a challenging text, and you can just blow past it, or you can dig. And that's my interest for all of us today. We dig. Let's read this in totality, starting in verse 14. Now, King Herod heard of him, heard of Jesus Christ, for his name had become well known. And he, Herod, said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his, brother's, his brother Philip's wife. For he married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against John and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man. And he protected him. And when he had heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Then an opportune day came 
when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his, his nobles and the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I will give it to you. He swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked him, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Hmm. Before we get too far into this text, it's important for us to understand who's who, the characters of the story. Um, this is our real only opportunity in this book of Mark to understand the who when it comes to Herods and who they are. And so let's give this a whirl, shall we? Um, we'll first just hit, a, hit some of the highlights and we'll keep it simple. There's a lot more people than what we're going to talk about today. But you can check this family tree out for yourself. I mean, maybe you do research online. You found your own family tree. Uh, like the woman on TV, she's, she's now uh, a cousin of... George Washington. Maybe you're a cousin of Herod the Great. Would that be a cool thing? No, it wouldn't be a cool thing. No. Uh -huh. um, first of all, Herod the Great, he ruled from uh, 37 BC to 4 AD. And he's the one who started it all. Uh, you probably remember him as Herod uh, that was alive at Jesus' birth. And he was the only uh, he was the one that the wise men came to and they asked him for help and, and then he turns around and he kills all the babies in Bethlehem. Uh, you can read about his story in Matthew 2 as well as in Luke chapter 1. Now he's not the Herod in our text this morning. Um, the oldest son was named Archelaus. Archelaus, he was the oldest. And he, who, he's not in the Bible other than one mention of his name and that's in Matthew chapter 2 verse 22. The son who gets some airtime, so to speak, Bible story time, uh, is Herod Antipas. He rules one fourth of the nation around the region of Galilee. Um, and he was there ruling from 4 AD to uh, 39 AD, about 35 years. And he, by the way, is the Herod in our story today, Herod Antipas. We'll get back to him in just a minute. The third brother is named Philip. Philip. He's only mentioned by name today as well as in Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Just, just a quick mention. But Philip, we need to keep his name in mind um, because he's going to play into our story as well. And then there's uh, Aristobulus, and then there's Herod Agrippa, and he's the one, Agrippa is the one, who killed James and imprisoned Peter, and he caused a lot of grief in the church. Uh, that's Herod Agrippa. And Herod Agrippa had a son, uh, that happens to be the last Herod in the Bible. Um, his name was Herod Agrippa II. And he ruled from 44 AD to 70 AD. Uh, he's the one who tried Paul as well as sent Paul to Rome. So if you haven't taken a picture yet of this nice picture, uh, you might want to grab that because he, uh, these are important folks for our text today. But Let's talk about a, sm a smaller section of this whole thing so it's clear. Herod the Great is on top, and he's the one who kills the babies in Bethlehem. Um, but then we get to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the one in our text today. And his brother Philip, who was the first husband of Herodias, his niece, who was first married to Uncle Philip, and then apparently she was a very cute niece because uh, her other uncle, uh, Herod Antipas, seduces her, his sister-in-law slash niece, <laughs> to leave his brother Philip 
He himself, Antipas, gets divorced and then takes uh, this Herodias to marry himself. So if you're gross all about all of this, which I per- personally am, uh, number one, you're not alone, uh, and number two, it gets worse. <laughs> So John speaks out against Herod Antipas that he's stealing his niece slash sister-in-law slash to be his wife uh, and that there's sin. John says this, and John let the ruler of the region plus he let the niece slash sister-in-law slash now wife have it. Didn't hold back. And that landed John the baptizer where? In prison. Make sense? Good. So from here on, every time we mention the name Herod, because there's four of them, we're gonna be talking about Herod Antipas. Can you say Antipas? Antipas, so good. Herod Antipas is our man. Verse 14, now King Herod heard of him, that's Jesus Christ, for his name had become well known. This particular guy in our text today, Antipas, um, is actually no king at all. He's no king at all. That area of Galilee is actually under Roman control at this time. And there's this guy named Emperor Augustus. Emperor Augustus, he says, no, you will not be called king. But the wife, Herodias, she pushes. She's a pusher. She's a controller. She pushed and pushed and pushed so much so that Herod finally tried for the last time to get this title king from Emperor Augustus. And the emperor's court says, you know what, you're a traitor. The writer of this book, John Mark, used the title King Herod uh, because it was a local custom. It was a local custom. Uh, to This whole king thing uh, shows up against, again later, uh, but it was a local custom. Now, King Herod is using new, and hearing news from all of the land, just north of him, that there's this popular teacher named Jesus who is doing three things. What are they? Preaching, healing, casting out demons. And the crowds are huge. Historians say anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people. That's a lot of people, no matter where you are. And in fact, uh, he was actually, Jesus was actually controlling the weather. Remember on the boat, the elements of the weather, as well as bringing dead people back to life. And as we read last week, he was sending men from this entourage called disciples or apostles, he's sending his entourage out to do the same work that he was doing. So there's a lot of hubbub. There's a lot of activity, and people's lives are being changed. So sure, Jesus was popular, and there's a l- plenty of reason for it. And Herod heard of him. Verse 14 continues, And he, Herod, said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. We know Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 11, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. That's pretty cool. Wouldn't you like to hear that of your name? Jesus saying that? Well, John was at the top of Jesus' list. I mean, he did what God wanted him to do, and everybody saw it. I mean, it was clear to everybody. He was preparing the way of the Lord and calling people to turn around, repent, and follow after God. And he was willing to lay down his own life. And John trusted this soon-coming Messiah that would take away the sin of the world. Uh, It's almost like Herod couldn't forget John. John was a pretty special guy. And he was feeling guilty. Why couldn't he forget John? Don't tell me it's him again. Maybe this servant of God was brought back to life. Uh, Maybe God wants to punish me and is using John, this other person, whoever he is, to do it. Herod probably always thought John had some special powers in his own life. It seemed to be the only logical reason. This must be John. Verse 15 says, Others said it was Elijah. Others said, it's the prophet or like one of the prophets. This is interesting to me. It's the, Herod, uh, he looks to his contemporary, who would be John, and the other people are looking in the Old Testament. They're looking backwards, and they thought Jesus was Elijah. 
because it was prophesied uh, Elijah would come before the Messiah did. And th on that text there in Ma Malachi 4. And other th others thought that Jesus was the prophet or one of the prophets when Moses said, uh, there's one coming after me in Deuteronomy. I mean, the prophet, Christophany. It's funny how people think of any other reason as to who this very popular person is. Uh, people start filling in the blanks with anybody else other than Jesus Christ. We still do it today, don't we? We still do it today. It's tough for people to solidly take a stand for Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus is offensive. Years ago in the Christian music industry, uh, many singers and artists were more evangelical uh, than they were uh, stars, you know, star. They were more than musicians, they were sharing the gospel. They really were. They were using music as a tool to share the Christ and the kingdom of God and encourage Christians. And something happened around the 1970s. Some of these performers wanted to expand their audience, have a broader appeal, a wider base, changing their lyrics, changing their music. It's called crossover. So instead of being very clear with the lyrics uh, and they're sharing this gospel, uh, they started doing songs that had veiled references to God. There's one group that was especially popular at the time. Praise the Lord. He can work through those who praise him. Our God inhabits praise, clear as crystal. Then they came out with a record that says, turn it over to a higher power. Really? A higher power. Instead of Herod submitting to Jesus Christ as the Son of God, Herod and the other people, they're trying to figure out uh, who this guy must have been. They wouldn't submit themselves to believing that he was indeed the Son of God. They wouldn't go there. Maybe he's this person. Maybe he's that person. Uh, why is it so hard for people to submit to the Son of God, Jesus Christ? Peter did it. Matthew. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Don't you just love it when Peter and others just say, This is Jesus. This is definitive in our statements. I pray, I pray for you that you would have clarity and boldness every week to tell somebody, Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. I pray that you do, and that the Lord use you. Verse 16, but when Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead, for Herod himself has sent out and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For he married her, because John had said to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Look first at verse 18. John's very clear. There's no holding back. It says, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Oh, now I get, I get this. I understand this. Why, why Herod was thinking uh, about John. Why John's right there in the front of his mind. Because John accused him of living in sin. And when someone accuses us of sin, it usually sticks. Because we know we're wrong. It's tough to forget, especially when we're guilty. Remember, John preached repentance. John was preaching. He has a clear and consistent message with everybody that he's talking to. And this family, Herod's of the world, uh, they're messed up. They're living outside of God's world, God's plan, God's law. And in fact, the law said in Leviticus, if a man takes his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. This sin really bothered John. I mean, it bugged him. And John was not going to hold back his feelings. He's not going to be politically correct. Uh, John didn't care who you were. You might be rich. You might be powerful. Doesn't really matter. Um, he's calling Herod and Herodias, repent. Turn around, people. And he said, just because you get a divorce does not give you a legal grounds for breaking up your brother's marriage and then marrying your sister-in-law. 
Uh, and Herod hears about this popular guy, uh, Jesus, and he's afraid that this man, quote unquote, uh, man, whoever he is, that this was actually John because he, he's got a guilty conscience. I know it's not Elijah. I know it's not the prophets. I know it's John. It, I just know it. I just know it. He's come back to get me. He's coming to get me. I'm, it's pretty emphatic tone here. I killed John, and this is why I killed him. The rest of our text explains the process and the guilt uh, that happens here in dealing with death. Guilt is brutal. I think you would agree with me. Guilt is plain brutal. And it tears a person apart from the inside out. It's hard, it's hard to see Jesus when there's guilt in your life. Uh, everything's a fog when we're guilty. And when we're walking in sin, when we're walking in that rebellion, it's just tough. So this is all happening because Herod marries his niece slash sister-in-law. And John told Herod and Herodias the truth. And he didn't compromise. Listen, it's not lawful. You are guilty. You are wrong. And John is giving us Christians an example here too. Take a stand. Don't compromise. Don't compromise morals. Don't compromise the Word of God. If we stand in for integrity, we will be standing for the truth. It might be costly, uh, but that's what John was doing. He's taking a stand for the truth. There's a gentleman named William Tyndale. You might know that name. He might, that name might be on your Bible. <laughs> he was born in 1494. And in a time that it was forbidden to translate the Bible into English, uh, he believed that everybody should have the opportunity to read the Bible in their own language, and not just the priests reading uh, in Latin. So instead of accepting that law, he took it upon himself to print Bibles in English. And he was what? Arrested. He was executed. He stood up for the truth, and it cost him his life. He was 42 years old. By the way, soon after he died, William Tyndale didn't get to see this, but the law was changed. And English Bibles were allowed. Thanks to his standing up, we can read the Bible today. Truth and right, sometimes it was very costly. Uh, it happened to William Tyndale. It happened to John. John said to Herod, based on the word of God, uh, you are wrong for marrying her, in verse 18. And Herod knew he was wrong. Uh, it says in verse 17 that Herod took personal retaliation and had John bound in prison for the sake of Herodias, his niece slash sister-in-law slash wife. <laughs> and I mean, it wasn't John's problem. John wasn't the one who was uh, guilty here. But he was just stating the truth. Picture in your mind a balance, a balance of weights. On one side of the balance is guilt, guilt which uh, holds us down. The other side is blame. It's natural when we are guilty of something to find other people or other circumstances to blame in order to explain away our actions or to balance out uh, our feelings. And that's kind of what's going on here. Uh, Herod knew that he was guilty. The balance, Herod knew that he was guilty for taking his brother's wife. And to get rid of that own guilt, uh, he wanted to blame somebody else. Herodias did the same thing. Uh, guilty, I need to blame somebody. And they put this blame game into action. As much as they felt guilty, they were balancing it out with blame. And that's what's happening here. As much as John was right, uh, he was stuck in the middle. And what happened? Prison. Prison. Well, that's not good enough for Herodias. She's not content here with this balance game. That's not done in her mind yet. Verse 19 says, Therefore Herodias held it against John and wanted to kill him. But she could not. 
For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So you get the picture here. The only one who wanted John dead was the wife, Herodias. Herod didn't want to kill John. He likes the guy. Well, sort of. He likes to hear him talk. He tells his wife, don't you dare touch him. <laughs> uh, but she says, we don't need this guy in our life. Um, He's telling us that we're living in sin. Let's just get him out of our life, then we can live happily ever after. And Herod and Herodias, well, they're both showing sin. They're both showing sin in their life. They're both guilty. I mean, they, they are coming from different views of how to handle the situation. Let him live. He needs to die. Let him live, he needs to die. There are so many people who knew that John was a just and holy man, as the text says. But originally, in the original Greek, it says that he was a fair and he was a dedicated man to the service of God. A servant of the Lord can't be just one of those without the other. You gotta have both. If we are fair and not holy, then we're just playing a game of being religious. And there's no relationship with God. There's a lot of people who are very good people. I think you'd meet them every day. But they're living in this sin. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Death. So being a good person, being just fair, is, uh, that will land you short. You're going to come up short. So John lived uh, both a just life as well as a holy life. And people knew that he was the real deal. Ask yourself, do I live a just and holy life? Do I walk the real deal? A am I playing religion? Only you and God know the answer to that. Only you and God know the motives of the heart. <laughs> and sometimes we don't know ourselves. It's interesting that Herod respected John and what he had to say. And as it says in verse 20, uh, Herod says the word protected him. He protected him. It's like Herod saying, you know what? You really tick me off by making me feel guilty, but I know what you're saying is right, and I like what you're saying, so keep talking. That's a weird dichotomy in any fascination. I mean, we can listen to the gospel message. We can hear inspirational messages. We can come to church week after week. We can listen to it on the radio, TV, online. Um, we can listen to guys with big personalities. We can listen to a guy with great hair. It really doesn't matter. Um, there's a lot of people who fit into that category. I have a friend who's a Christian, lives back east. He goes to church every single week. Um, he doesn't read the Bible except in church. He pulls it out and takes a walk with it from his home. He really likes those inspirational feel-good stories. And not that feel-good stories are bad, uh, but my observation is that this is where he spends his focus. Feel-good. Successory. Some of you might know that name. And so instead of keeping his eyes on Jesus, um, instead of telling others about what Jesus Christ has done in his own life, uh, this guy is more interested in mottos in mottos that, that, that leave Jesus Christ out of the equation. This guy had his office filled with these quotes uh, all over the walls. Always be yourself. There's one quote from Buddha, uh, which he had on his wall. Each day we are born again. Psalm 1 says, meditate on his word day and night. Joshua 1.8 says, uh, meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all according to that is written in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success and Herod was living a double life I mean John you're a bad man <laughs> you make me feel guilty off to prison with you John I love hearing what you have to say come here and talk to me John <laughs> the reality is we can't have it both ways. We can't live a double life. We just can't. We got to be all in. We got to be all out. Double life, no way. We need to agree with God that 
um, we are sinners. I'm a sinner. I agree with you. We need to listen to what God says. And then we need to be a doer of his word and not a hearer only, deceiving ourselves. The first commandment is the first because it's, it is, needs to be number one. Number one in our life because he is indeed number one. Exodus 20, you shall have no other gods before me. And Jesus was clear about this in the New Testament. Uh, in Matthew 22, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Hmm. I'm not talking here about being religious. I'm talking about nurturing a relationship, not just having, nurturing a relationship with a God who loves you, because he does. Herod wanted to feel good. John wasn't there to make Herod feel good. John was there to put God first. And if we're not putting God first, if there's no change in our life, guess what? We're just wasting time. We just are. Our eternity is at stake. Our eternity is at stake. John was calling Herod to turn around, to follow after God. And that's what we're saying here today, here at Calvary Chapel Saving Grace Mesa. Turn around, follow after God. But Herod said, sorry, John, um, I like listening to you, and uh, you've crossed the line. You're making my, my new wife feel uncomfortable as well. I uh, don't like that very much. It's a person who's insensitive to what God is saying. It's almost like having a spiritual scar tissue. The Bible calls it a seared conscience. My first real job outside of the family farm when I was 16 years old was working at a McDonald's. And I got to learn everything going around, you know, make all the sandwiches, make the fries, work up front. Uh, the drive through here's the shakes, uh, cleaning the vats of grease. That was always fun. And uh, the first thing I learned was this process of searing, putting a frozen piece of meat that you love so much onto these hot griddles, extremely hot. The Bible talks about a seared conscience in 1 Timothy 4. If our conscience is seared, it's cauterized. That means that our spirit and our soul, which is our mind, our will, and emotions, um, they are made insensitive. Our, we've got an insensitive life. Nothing goes in. It just stays on the surface. It's, it's like our sense of what's right and wrong has been dulled. It's kind of what's happening here in Herod's life and Herodias' life. John is calling Herod to walk in the Spirit, to be a person of integrity, to, rep to repent and to have a clean conscience. But he's not there. Herod's not there. Herod's soul has been scarred with this hot iron. And he's no longer sensitive to anything that's morally correct. Sure, Herod might hear. He might hear what's happening. He might, it's on the outside, but but it's not going to go into his heart. It's not going in, and the words are not changing anybody. He's spiritually seared. Verse 21 says, Then an opportune day came when Herod, and his, Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. Herodias, who is Herod's wife slash niece slash sister-in-law, um, she bore this grudge. I mean, it's a grudge. And she's working behind the scenes to get what she wants. There's an old phrase, opportunity never knocks twice, which means take the opportunity when you've got it. You might not get it again. That's what this evil woman, and yeah, she was evil. That's what she did. And there's a lesson here. Um, look at the ingredients of this strategy that we read about. She's getting what she wants. She knew what to expect from this all-male birthday party. The drinking would lead to sensuality. And she could force the issue by peer pressure. They're normally in this drinking session, with, there was dancing. There's these court dancers. And then they bring in the prostitutes. But as bad as that is, these Herods go even a step further. And 
Herodias sends in her daughter. Sends in her daughter into that environment. It's like, Herodias, what are you thinking? She probably didn't win the Mother of the Year award uh, at that time. <laughs> but we learn from Josephus that this daughter's name is Salome. And then there's this thing called peer pressure. Uh, what a powerful combination those three things are. Drinking, sensuality, peer pressure. With all of these other high officials there hanging around, these chief muckety-mucks uh, doing their thing. And everybody, everybody's just hanging there and just enjoying the party. But everything that is real, everything that's wise, gets thrown out the window. It's history. It's out of the equation. And now we see foolishness come in. I've talked with other pastors who have counseled marri married couples for years. And they've said to me this consistent thing, that there's problems with most marriages, and they start with this combination of these three ingredients. In some fashion, people making a wrong decision to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And it kills a marriage. It's amazing how Christians think, how people think. I can't handle a party. I'm just looking at the other woman. I'm not touching. I don't want to look bad in front of all my friends. Here's a warning for us Christians. Stay clear. Stay clear. Stay clear of these things. Stay clear of the, of the partying scene. Stay clear. Listen, number one, witnessing at a bar is never going to be a good idea. It's never going to end well. And like Herod, your decision-making is going to be skewed if you've got drink in you. <laughs> if you are married, flirting with someone of the opposite sex is out of bounds. The marriage vow says forsaking all others. That means for the rest of your life, you're committed to one and only one person. With that vow, you are abandoning everybody else. And my attention is given to that one person in my life. End of story. And third, the peer pressure, uh, that means I'm letting other people control my decision making. Any combination of these three is fatal, literally fatal. It'll separate the best of marriages. In this case, it was fueled to murder. And that might sound extreme. You might say, what are you talking about? Just watch the nightly news. You'll see a combination of any one or, or all of these three things, and it will show up and happen every day. Verse 22, when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Bad decisions. Bad decisions. Salome had no problem dancing seductively in front of her uncle slash stepfather, uh, as, as well as all the friends, and trying to get their attention to ask this special request. Whatever you want, Herod said. But there's something funny about this. Uh, he was ruler under Roman authority. Remember that? He's a ruler under Roman authority. That means that he had no kingdom of his own to give. He wasn't in control. He wasn't a king. He's all talk. He was giving away something that really didn't belong to him. But no matter, it was a, an expression. He's saying here, I'll give you a large gift. It'll have limits, but I'll give you a large gift. And it was a statement based on emotion being sucked away with it. His wife strategically creates this whole weird thing and threw her daughter in the middle of it. Let's get these guys drunk. You seduce them, and I'll get what I want. Marriage is the opposite. Marriage is the giving of myself to my mate. Adultery says, I, I'm getting what I want. The epitome of selfishness.
And Herod and Herodias were each getting what they wanted. <laughs> Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, that even if you are looking at a woman with adultery in your heart, you've done it. And adultery might seem great in the moment, but Proverbs 5 tells us to keep our heart far from adultery. Keep our heart far from adultery because it leads to one place, death. And we know that this proverb came true because years later, Her Herod and Herodias, they committed suicide. Verse 24, so she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in and with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. She's a teenager, a young teenager. She doesn't know anything about John. She doesn't have a bone to pick with him. She was a pawn that's being used by the mother for murder. Mom, what do I do? She did, Herodias didn't wait, didn't stop, didn't hem and haw, didn't wonder. She's cunning. She's vile. And she has her plan already worked out. She says, get me his head. She was getting what she wanted all along. We don't do that, do we? Strategically manipulate to get things that we want? God forgive us. Mom's direction is clear. I want him dead. Uh, I, I want to see it. I want other people to see it. I want solid proof. So the young girl goes back. Give me his head. And she adds a little presentation thing here going on too. Uh, put it on a platter. <laughs> That's unique. Verse 26. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, she did not want to refuse her. Herod is in between a rock and a hard place, and he was afraid to cross his wife, and he's afraid to be embarrassed in front of his friends. So either way, this so-called king was afraid of people. So he does something that he knows is wrong. We do the same thing. We do things that we know are wrong. We know we shouldn't do it, but we do it. James says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So Herod's mouth gets in the way. Um, and he's more interested in giving in to peer pressure than doing what's right. And talk about peer pressure. I mean, it starts so young. Come on, come on over here. Try this, try these drugs. Cigarettes, alcohol, sex. One study said 90% of teens have experienced peer pressure. If you do this, you'll be popular. If you do this, you'll have so many more friends. Actually, uh, it affects all age groups in all circumstances. And though you can't see it or touch it, peer pressure is a real deal. Peer pressure's real. Just watch TV. You'll see the peer pressure coming through the TV into your living room. And you'll be told to do something. Come on, everybody's doing this. Everybody. Most of the time, the pressure uh, leads people to sin. Verse 26 says that Herod was exceedingly sorry. That original text for this is greatly distressed. The same word used to describe Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark chapter 14. And based on that word, Herod was really, really upset, really upset that John, who he enjoyed listening to, was going to die at his command. Uh, before this, he had been protecting John. That's what it says. He's protecting John from death, but he couldn't do that anymore. And it was all because of bad choices. 
Let's continue, verse 27. Immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded them in prison, beheaded him in prison, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Verse 27 starts with this word immediately. Let's get it over with. Let's move on. Uh, while everybody's still here, let's make something happen, and let's be clear about it. Let's be sure that everybody sees right here, right now, what's occurring. We rush, rush. We rush, and we make bad decisions. People are pressured into buying something, even, um, that they don't need. I bet that's happened to us. Uh, we're doing something... Preston just saying, I've got to have this. Advertising creates this sense of urgency. Um, save like never before, you know? This, uh, hurry up, this, this sale's only going to last for 26 more minutes, and then it's gone forever, ever, 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 ever. And that's what's happening here with Herod. Let's just get this over with. Then I can show all my friends how powerful I am. All my peers don't think, let's just do. Let's just do. And most of the time, the rush, I think you would agree, is a bad decision. If Herod just took the night to sleep on it, let me, just, let me just take 24 hours and ponder this one, his liquor would have been cleared out of his brain, and all of the friends would have gone, and guess what? John probably would not have been murdered that night. Herod would have had a clear mind, and it just would have been interesting. Now, this is an interesting sidebar for me uh, in our text Take a deep breath. Pray. Pray about decisions. Unless you're jumping out, out of an airplane where you've got to do it right now, uh, there, you, very few times in life when we need to be jumping or making decisions right now. But when you know the will of the Lord, when you know the will of the Lord, then it's time to make a decision. Don't wait then. Step out in faith. And what is God's will? When is it right to make a decision right now? I'll tell you. First Timothy, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's his desire. That is his will for your life. Second Corinthians 6, now is the day of salvation. So that's the only decision that you should make immediately. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, you don't have to hem and haul about that at all. Make that decision now. And if you've not made that decision, you need to make it now. And if that's you, and you know who you are, um, then after the service, you need to come forward, and you need to be praying about that. And let's get this taken care of now. As we close today, there are a couple of questions that come from the, today's text that we need to confirm and answer. Number, number one is, have I made a decision for Jesus Christ? Now. And number two is, what will I do this week to take a stand for Jesus Christ? What will I be doing to make a difference, to take a stand, to be a bright light in a very, very dark world? Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the way, the truth, the life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can open your word and that the depths of your word are here for us. Lord, we thank you that we can take a stand and say without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. And Lord, you have called us to not compromise your word, You've called us to not live a double life. You have called us to not be at the wrong place at the wrong time, but to take a stand for you in the very world that we live in, to be a very bright light for you, to represent you well. And so, Lord, that's our desire. And I pray, Father, that as we make that stand this day, that you would be glorified, that you'd use us, you would provide opportunities, and we'd tell the story of 
how you have worked in our life. We look forward to what you're going to do this week. And we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.